difficult to find. It's not the largest book in your New Testament, but uh, uh, it's uh, it is a very, very well read, very popular book. But uh, we're going to start with the first section of Philippians today, and uh, we're going to talk about the mark, the the mark of fellowship. And uh, want to just jump on this right at the start because. You know, a lot of time, and it's appropriate that we're meeting in what is, is called here the fellowship building or the fellowship hall, but it, it's, it's amazing that we use the word fellowship so much. People say, hey, come over to the house, you know, for some fellowship time, or, you know, they got together to watch a ball game, or got together to go see a church softball team play. So, man, we had some great fellowship, and uh, maybe you took a retreat or something like that at some time or another, and you might say, man, the, the fellowship was just fantastic. But fellowship is one of those words that we use a lot, and sometimes we use words so much, after a while it sort of loses its pizzazz. And so as a result of that, we try to think of another word for it. I mean, there are words such as great or terrific or fantabulous or, or things like that. And, and car, car dealers are are probably notorious for this because they'll use a word and then after a while they'll try to think of a better word to describe their cars because they're usually trying to entice us to, to sell them. Do I need to start over? <laughs> Good. I didn't want to anyway. But uh, uh, we'll just keep moving. But they try to come up with some, some different words and uh, they, you know, they'll come up with words like, like awesome. But you know, we can't do that with Bible words. We can't just say we're just going to come up with a different word. Uh, what we need to do though is to go through the exercise of finding out what it really means and then go back and deal with that. For example, uh, the, the word fellowship, let me just tell you, there's a blank there for you to fill out, not, not long, but really the word fellowship just simply means to have in common. Yeah, that's what it means. Uh, we're, we're partners in this. Uh, we share together. Uh, but, but it basically means for us to, to have in, in common. And this little book, the book of Philippians today, and this passage we're going to look at, I think will give us some of the intimate marks that, that a group of believers should have as we are together in, in our bond in Christ. And so we're going to take a look at some things that, that set us apart, really, from, from the rest of the world. And, and I, I sense there is a great deal of of genuine fellowship in the, in the church body here. But uh, uh, but before we jump in to Philippians 1, let me give you a little background on, on this particular book. And uh, the background can be found in Acts chapter 16. I'm not going to read you know the whole thing. I may read sections of it. But in, in Acts chapter 16, start with about verse 11, the writer Luke you know, tells us, he said, we, we were traveling. We were going from place to place and town to town. And then he says, um, down in, in verse 12, he says, from there we traveled uh, to Philippi, a Roman colony and a leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there for several days. And so that they did go to this town called Philippi. And as was their practice, when it came to the Sabbath day, Paul and, and Silas and the crew that was with him, they tried to find a, a body of believers that were joining together in prayer. And so they, they left the city gate, they went down to the river, and, and they started looking for some believers, and, and they did not find any. But they did find a, a group of women who were there by, by the river, and, and, and Paul started talking to them about the gospel, and a lady by the name of Lydia... And it's interesting, she's called Lydia a seller of purple. Now you think, okay, big deal. So she sold purple. Uh, basically, that was an indication that she dealt with high-level clothing, okay? And so she sold to people who were well-to-do, and probably she was well-to-do herself because of that. So here was a lady that was fairly well-to-do from Philippi, out gathered with some other ladies, and they were you know, talking, maybe they were praying, maybe they were having some fellowship of their own you know, out, out there. But in the process, Lydia gave her faith to Christ. And it says here um, in verse uh, 15, uh, when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider uh, me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So immediately, just, just like that, she opened up her home and...
early days, which is not, not too far out of, uh, out of the imagination to, to think that based on what we read here. But then Paul and Silas, they began to um, just to walk and to try to meet other people. And it tells us in this particular chapter, there was, there was a young girl who was possessed by a spirit that uh, could tell the future. And her owners, they profited from this. They loved this. This girl could tell the future, do forecasting and things like that, and they charged people for her forecasts. And as Paul and Silas were walking the streets, she was saying, hey, listen to these guys. They can lead you to God. They can tell you how to get saved. Now, we might think that's cool. school, going to work, or going shopping, if somebody walked along beside of us and started shouting to everybody nearby, hey, you need to listen to them. They, uh, they have the gospel and they can teach you about God. I mean, would we want to get away from them? Would we? I would. <laughs> I, I, mean, I would. And, and you read here, and, and it says that, um, you know, Paul, it, it, it says, let's see, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Christ Jesus, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, boom, the spirit came out. And the young lady lost her ability to tell the future and her owners lost their profit. And they were highly upset. So they went to the officials and they said, hey, look, there's some strangers here in town, some newcomers here in town. In other words, they ain't from around here. You know, and so uh, we they're they're teaching strange customs and strange things, and so the authorities came, arrested Paul and Silas. You read it. The jailer and said, "You make sure these guys stay put." And you read the story. It was about midnight that Paul and Silas here they were. What they decided to do? Sing. They started singing. And he started singing. I mean, think about it. I mean, they're beaten. Their clothes are ripped off of them. And they're, they're, they're tied in locks there in, in a prison cell. And they start singing. And they were praising God. And we read that there was an earthquake. The gates of the prison came open. The locks that were on the prisoners came loose. The jailer looked in, didn't see anything. And Paul and Silas said, no, 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 we're all here. We're all here. You know, none of, none of us escaped. We're, we're all here. And the jailer came in and he said, Look, I don't know what you guys got, but I don't have that security. I, I don't have that faith. I want that. And you read this chapter and you find out Paul and Silas read this man, led this man to Jesus Christ. That night, the jailer took them home. Uh, and uh, Paul and Silas told the jailer's family, Everybody in the family was baptized. The next day, the jailer took Paul and Silas back and he told them, hey, look, these guys are actually Roman citizens. We stepped over our bounds of authority. And the uh, leaders started saying, well, you just got to just go ahead and sneak out of town and we'll keep this hush hush. And Paul and Silas said, no way. You violated our rights. We want people to know that we are Roman citizens and what happened here yesterday was wrong. And so... The leader said, okay, look. This particular part of Philippians is, maybe I went into a little more detail than you wanted to know, but that's a little background about it. And what we find, you know, can you imagine, you know, Paul was in prison and jail quite a bit. So he's writing this letter from prison again. We, we, don't, know, we don't think Paul had children because, well, there was a slight indication he might have been married at, at some point, but he says, oh, you know, I'm not married. So he probably didn't have any kids. And um, can you imagine if the kids went to mom and said, hey, mom, uh, where's dad? And she, she said, well, he's in jail again. And he's out preaching, but he's in jail again. You know what? What a great testimony that would have been for the kids. But anyway, Paul is writing from, from prison again to the Philippians. And it's a powerful little letter. And basically... He is saying this. Let's start reading with verse 2. We'll read down through verse 6. He says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of, of Christ Jesus. And so, you know, we all, he's, he's writing to the church. We know Lydia is there. We know that the Philippian jailer is there. And probably that young lady who had that spirit thrown out of her, you know, was there and maybe possibly some others. But he's writing to them and he's telling them, first of all, I have you in my mind. I think the mark, one of the marks of a genuine fellowship and genuine Christian body is that we nerves okay I said we were on our mind and, and sometimes there are those situations where people we think of them they are on our nerves but that's not what this is talking about here he said he said I'm thinking of you and you are on my mind and you know Paul this is strange because here he is in jail and who's he thinking about the church people he's thinking about others how are they doing too often we get so caught up in our situation that all we see is ourselves. You know, the, the, the happiest people I know, the most, most joy-filled people I know are people who have you know, that, that Paul was in. And the situation was tough that the Philippians were in. And yet, he was thinking about them and, and how they were doing. As a matter of fact, when you read through the book of Philippians, if, when we do get into chapter 2, we'll find out that Jesus, when he stepped out of heaven, he wasn't thinking of himself. He was thinking about you, thinking about me. He was thinking about you know the population of the whole world for all time. And yet he stepped out of heaven you know, for us. And then in Philippians 2, we hear about Timothy again. And Paul just mentioned him a second ago in the very introduction when he, he talks about Timothy is with him at this particular point. But uh, sometimes we're just in a vicious cycle of thinking only of ourselves. And, and if we're going to be people of joy, we've got to have other people on our mind. And the way to do that is just to, to think of, of them. And in other words, you want to... Uh, uh, to be loved, and I would say love other people. And, and there's still something unique here when you read this uh, text that uh, we just read about the Apostle Paul. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you, and in all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy. Every time he thought of them, they brought joy to his heart. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons, and he mentions it you know, right here, why he felt that way. I mean, in spite of the fact that he was jailed, in spite of, in spite of the And the reason he had joy, as we read in verse 5, he says, because of your partnership, in other words, of your fellowship, of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now, Lydia, the lady with the spirit that, that they cast out, uh, the, the Philippian jailer, you have been with me from the very beginning in the sharing uh, of the gospel. And uh, not... And, and read it and find out that uh, they had a great deal in, in common. Now, I know to some people their problems are worse than what the Apostle Paul had. I mean, my goodness... The heat went out. Somebody may be sat in their chair. You know, we had to go to a different room. And I know those are those are ribbed of problems. I'm grateful for your spirit of flexibility. I, I really am. And you think, but that's no big deal. Well, we ought to think that way. It's no big deal. We're going to meet. We're going to gather. And we're going to greet. And it's not about us, is it? It's about gathering together with God's people and, and, and one another. in the first century, but here they were. He thought of them and had joy because of the fact that they participated together in the gospel. But there's another reason. Verse 6, being confident of this, 
that he who began a work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. The second reason he had joy when he thought about them was because he knew God was still at work in their life. Some of you may remember this song. I thought about it this morning early when I was reading over my notes, and I thought, ah. or sing it to you, but there was a, a singer by the name of Steve Green that was popular back about 30 years ago. Does that name ring a bell to anybody? Okay, I see one, one hand go up. He had a song called He Who Began a Good Work in You. And it was based on this particular verse of scripture. Those of you who are YouTubers, type in Steve Green and He Who Began a Good Work and see what, what pops up and listen to powerful, powerful song. And basically it's this. You know, he who began a good work in you uh, will be faithful to complete that good work. And the Apostle Paul was saying, I'm confident that God is still working in your life. I, I got to tell you, nothing blesses a preacher more than to know that the people that he teaches and, and serves on a regular basis, that God is at work in their life. Really. That, that they're growing, that they're walking in his footsteps, that God is using them in their day-to-day -day life. And, and Paul is just saying, hey, I'm confident that God is still you know, at, at work in your life, and, and I am so grateful for that. So that's, that's the first mark I see in this passage, and that is that he, they were on his mind. The second thing I want us to see is they were in his heart. And let's read with the uh, uh, There, I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share, there's that word, sharing, participation, fellowship, same root word. Lost my place there, but don't look away. You, know, you share in God's grace with me. And God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Jesus Christ. And so it's, it's incredible that uh, he is, he's saying that to them, you are in my heart. Um, and it's only right for me, you know, to feel that way. He says, um, sometimes it's important for us to know that other Christians have us on their heart. You know, I, I didn't really know the value of that until it's been, it's been years now. But back... Uh, so it was when our youngest son, our oldest son, was just, just an infant. I was diagnosed with meningitis. And uh, it was a bad case. It was not the... I just said, hey, you're, you're, you're one of the lucky ones. You got, vi you got a virus and it settled in your meninges. But I was in isolation for a week. It took several days for them to find out that I did not have, have the bad kind. But in, in those days, when I was in isolation in the hospital, uh, not knowing whether I was going to you know, live or die, you know, I, I started getting cards from some of the church folks. And then if I could be finally, they could finally allow young whippersnapper, know-it-all minister at that time. And I hadn't up to that point seen the value of cards and phone calls and visits. And I wept when those people made their love for me known. There are a lot of people in isolation right now. You know that. You've mentioned them and, and, you know, for these last several months. Uh, the people who are sick. And these people are because a lot of them feel all alone. Several years ago, I made a visit on a man. This is um, where Sally and I were living in, in the city limits of Los Angeles at the time, and I was ministering at a church there. And I went to visit a guy. He and his wife had attended church, and he said, hey, I'd like you to stop by the house. So I did, and as we were talking, his name was George, George Soto. And uh, George became a good friend of mine. But, but that night, he, he, he told me, as I had one of the elders with me, he told me, he says, I am so lonely. 
I am just so, I don't have a friend in the world. And I thought, here we are. We live in a city of six million people, and this guy is lonely. You know the truth. You can be surrounded by people and be lonely. You can also be alone and not be lonely. And the way that magic works have us in their heart. And no matter what we go through, they love us and we love them. Do you agree with that? Yes. We, can, we can handle it. We can survive. We can make it as long as we know we're in the heart of, of other people. Uh, I have a group of people that love me. It's tough right now, but I have a group of people that are praying for me, and they love me, and I'm in their mind, and I'm in, in their heart. And it's important that we be people who, who are like that. Uh, you know, one of the things that we can do to, to help others, to let them know that we're there in our heart, is to walk around with a spirit of forgiveness. Because you can't work with people, and you can't serve. And differ on it, you know, different things like that. And so, and maybe even say something wrong or do something wrong or, or be misunderstood, but it's important for us to walk around with a spirit uh, of, of forgiveness. Um, let me just ask you to turn back a couple of pages um, to the book of Galatians. We're in the book in Philippians. First thing you do when you see, you see when you turn back, you see Ephesians. But you just go back a couple of pages, and, and there's Galatians. In Galatians chapter 5, Verse 22, it says this, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such thing, there, there's no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus, basically says those who belong to Christ Jesus have these fruits of the Spirit. Because we've crucified ourselves, and he's the one that, that, that's living in us. If we are in the heart of other people, and if we have Jesus Christ living in us, the way it is known is because we have the fruit of the Spirit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. And that's a good thing to have. You go back a few more pages to the book of, uh, of Romans, Romans chapter 15, verse 7. And it's all summed up in this one verse. Uh, and, and, I, and I love it. It's one of my favorite verses in the New Testament. Accept one another then, just as Christ Jesus accepted you in order to bring you to Christ. We have no reason. We have no reason to ever say to anybody, I can never forgive you. I can never accept you. Right? right? Amen? And so, anyway, here the Apostle Paul was, was looking back at a church of Philippi where this crazy lady was following around at one point saying, hey, listen to these guys. Embarrassing them? Embarrassing them galore? And he said, fine, get out of her in the name in Christ and respected her, and loved her, and he was writing to encourage and knowing that, that this whole church body is deep in my heart, and, and fellowship is a beautiful thing when we love one another, and, um, but there's more to it than having people in our mind and having people in our heart, and we have a privilege to do something that no other group, no other organization has really the privilege to do. And that is the last thing that Paul says. I have he says this, and this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best, and you may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise uh, of God. And Paul said, I have you in, in my prayers 
Uh, you know, one of the neat things I, I appreciate about this congregation is uh, your your prayers you have for other people. You, you have, a, you know, I'll say. Um, and each week, and I don't know if this was you know, brought about by COVID or whether you did it before COVID, but in our worship time, you talk about the people and you add names and you you detract names um, of people who are in need. But there is, we can take people to God in prayer in ways much more than their physical needs. And right now, there are a lot of physical needs that people have. Uh, we can pray for you know their spirit. We can pray for them to grow. We can pray that they're not that they not be alone. We can, but we can pray for much more than physical needs. And if all we do is pray for physical needs, pray that your love may abound more and more. How about let's add to our prayer list that the people we're praying for, that their love for God would grow during this time. Would that make a difference? See, I, when, when we love something, we want to know more about it. When you love somebody, you want to know more about them. I know when, <clears throat> when I was a, a student in high school, man, I loved And, and I just want to learn as much as I could about that. And uh, when, when you love God, you want to find out as much as you can uh, about him. And notice what he said uh, here a little bit more. Because, see, love is always sensitive to, to the one that we love. We want to find out what they like, what they are like, what they dislike, what they want us to do. And, and he says this, I pray that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Now, let's talk about that thing on knowledge. You know, we've done pretty good with that one. And what we end up doing when we think we know a lot about God is sometimes we, well, often we come up Can't do that. Can't do this. Am, am, am I am I in, am I in left field on this, or do you know what I'm talking about? Do, do you know Christians who live strictly by a list of do's and don'ts? Yeah, there are some people out there that you know they, they live strictly by a list of do's and don'ts, and, and in some ways there's a strong list, uh, spirit of legalism there, and there needs to be some rights and some wrongs and some do's and don'ts. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you know pitch them pitch them all away. But uh, Paul goes on to say here, to say, hey, wait, you know, there's, there's more to it than the list of do's and don'ts. Because, you know, when I was a young person, I was told you can't do that. My initial question was, well, what's wrong with that? Tell me, I mean, what's, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that music? What's wrong with drinking that? What's wrong with doing that? What's wrong with doing this? Anybody here ever ask that question? Come on, be honest. All right. The first hands go up where are young people, okay? So, okay, it took us a minute to get it. But yeah, we, we've asked that question. What's wrong with this? And what Paul is maybe giving us a little hint. He addresses it in the next statement. He says, uh, let me get back down there to it. I pray that your love may abound more in knowledge, but here's, here's where he goes. He says, but your depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best. So see, the, maybe the best question to ask is, what's right about this? Is this the best thing I could do? Is this the best activity for me to be involved with? Is this the best thing for me to drink? Is this the best? Not just what's wrong with it, but what, what's, what's good with this? And he's saying, may we grow in knowledge and depth of insight so that we may be able to discern what is best and get this to be pure and blameless until the day of, of, of Christ. Um, asking the right question. Let's 
standard there is. But if we're asking what's right with this, we're lifting the bar quite a bit and saying, I, I want to do that which is best. I want to do that which is right. I want to do that which is pure and blameless. And I want to have the greatest insight. I don't want to do something where I just barely stay out of trouble. Every now and then I hear people say, well, you know, as long as I just barely slip under the gates of heaven, I'll be happy with that. No, you won't. I'm not so sure that's going to happen. The way I understand it, when we go in, we're going to be walking in, and then we're going to hit our knees because we're seeing our Savior, every one of us. But Paul is saying here, he's saying, folks, I, I, you, you're in my heart, and I'm praying for you, and you're in my prayers, and I want us to be people who are sincere and blameless as we stand before God. That word blameless, standard and our standard are very often two different things. Let's make sure we're looking at his standard and that we're not looking at our own selves as being good, but let's make sure we're looking at, at his standard. Uh, so, I, you know, I guess what I'm saying is a Christian is not just somebody who just doesn't do the bad things, but does, does good things. Uh, Jesus told an account, and I, I, I was digging for it, and, and I know. Of, of a man who cleaned out his house and his house was filled with evil spirits and the house was just sitting there empty. And it said that the, that the spirits went out and around and, and, but something was going to occupy that empty space. And what it was occupied with were spirits that were worse than the first ones who left. See, we can be people that maybe we get rid of all the do's and don'ts, but we better put something in its stead in our life, or what was worse may occupy us, is all I'm saying. Blameless, okay? And that's you're going to have to determine what that is for you. I can't, I can't give you, you know, that that list. Um, Sometimes we think, okay, I can't go here, I can't do this, I can't do this. I guess God just wants me to stay home and, uh, and just do nothing. No, not necessarily. He wants us to go out. He wants it to be light. The fruit of righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ to the glory and, and the praise of, of God. And I, I already read it to you a minute ago. The fruit he's talking about is the fruit of the Spirit. He wants us to be filled with love, joy, peace, and patience and kindness. He uh, wants us to be filled with the love for the lost. Those people are separated from, from Christ. He wants us to be filled with that. And as we'll get to in uh, uh, Philippians chapter 8 in a few weeks, he wants us to be thinking on those things which are good and right and holy and, and do those things. So those, those, in my opinion, you should take a look at this first oh, two, three paragraph. Those are the marks that ought to separate us from the rest of the world. And the fellowship that we have is, hey, you're on, you're on my, you're in my mind, you're in my heart, and you're in my prayers. And it's not just something I say, but it's something that, that I, I live out. I wrote this down this week on the back of some notes that I had, and it said, Philippians, and all people could have this, what, what a difference it, it would be. You know, these verses, I, I don't think that they're difficult. I don't think we need to retranslate them. We just need to practice them. We just simply need to put in practice. Far too often, we want to go from one Bible study to the next to hear something else, and I think God would say, wait a minute. These very simple things I have for you, put them into practice in your life. And what not and, and that's a great thing to do, but to make sure we're celebrating one another, our bond in Christ, who He is. You're in my heart. I love you. You love me, and we can make it through anything together. And I'm always praying for you. Let's let's stop and pray, and then we'll we'll move on.
Our Father, thank you for this first section of uh, Philippians, and we get to dig into the heart of the Apostle Paul. Here he was, uh, once again, just sitting in a, in a dark prison, and yet his heart was on the church body, and those people brought him joy. And he knew they were with him from the start. They would stay with him through the end. And God, he knew that they were all sharing together and you were still at work in them. The people who are here, the people who are part of this body, and may we continue to pray for one another and pray for the lost and see people come to know you. Thank you for being our God and may our lives reflect who you are and how we live. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you. One of the things that I think about you people when I'm down in San Diego and y'all were up here and you get uh, with us you get the fill of us that we may not know him if we were not Christians because we fellowship with one another. And even though Buddy talked about it be getting on people's nerves. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, even when we get on one another's nerves, we know that we're Christians and we know that the, the, the person that's gotten on our nerves is uh, trying to do God's will, trying to do, we may disagree with some of the, what they think, but we they're trying, and God's still working with them. And we have to remember that when we get on each other's nerves. one another. That's a, isn't, it, isn't it something that that your name is being spoken before God and before the throne of grace your name is being spoken you may not even know that your name is being spoken and when it's being spoken but that's powerful stuff like that yeah. So fellowship is one of the things that makes being a Christian I, I can't imagine somebody saying I'm a Christian but I don't go to church well that's one of the things that God has given us is fellowship with one another that's one of the things we should be enjoying uh, it's, it's you know, it's hard to believe they, they might uh, think that way. Uh, I'm not sure they've ever experienced real fellowship if they're not engaged in it, if they're a Christian. So, but anyway, I just wanted to share them thoughts with you. And uh, uh, don't forget our meeting and... I guess we can sing uh, one uh, verse of Just As I Am. What do you want to sing? Take the name of Jesus. Oh.
Father in heaven, we thank you so much for fellowship, for the church. We thank you that Jesus went to the cross and, and he gave his life in order that we may have this experience as Christians here on earth. We just thank you so much for one another. We thank you that uh, we are on each other's minds, that we pray for one another. We just pray, Father, that we will continue to do that as your people. Let us go out and uh, let us show the fruits of the Spirit to others as We just pray, Father, we might minister to those outside of Christ and help them to come to know that salvation through Jesus is what life is all about. For we ask these things in Jesus' name.